Were you going to introduce me? Yeah, hang on. Okay, I'm sorry. There it is. Okay. So, um, I'm David Flannery, and I'm on uh, Zoom here with Michael Jones, who is our um, synchrotron-based micro X-ray fluorescence expert here at QUT. And he's going to run through um, how the Beamline scientists and other users use a program called GeoPixie to analyze the uh, data that comes off the Australian synchrotron. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, um, or afternoon, I suppose. Uh, GeoPixie is a software which we use to uh, process uh, X-ray fluorescence data. Uh, it can handle a lot of different inputs. Uh, at the Australian Synchrotron, we use it to process the 384 element my uh, fluorescence detector data. Um, it works through a process of dynamic uh, array matrix fitting. Uh, and I'll just run through quickly the basic process, and then I suppose we'll go into some more details. So if you can see the, uh, the bottom left window here, we have a, a window called Spectrum Display, and this is sort of where we start with GeoPixie, importing the spectrum, doing some energy calibration, uh, visualizing the spectrum, uh, and we have counts and energy in uh, KEV. Uh, and we sort of go in, a, uh, in an anti-clockwise way around the screen. So the next uh, one is uh, X-ray spectrum fit, where we are selecting elements. Uh, we're doing some more background fitting, uh, fitting things like Compton uh, and elastic scatter. Uh, from then on up, we, we do one which is called sort EVT files. And this is where we're uh, taking the fit that we developed in the X-ray spectrum fit window and applying it to some uh, energy versus time data files that come off the detector. So this sorts all the files according to, sorts all, all the photon events according to the matrix that we fit it to. And then from there, we also have some, uh, some flux parameters where we're putting in some conversions to, to quantitate the data. Uh, and there's a whole lot of other different options. Uh, and then we move on to the, the window where we get our final image and there's some image processing things we can do in there. So, uh, we'll just quickly run through that process. So in the spectrum... Before you do, Michael, could you take a step back for a moment and yeah. uh, explain how this program is accessed? So this is not running on your local machine, is it? So no, this is running on, uh, if I move this window, you should be able to see on uh, the Australian Synchrotron Computing Infrastructure. So GeoPix is a software that is a, not a free software. Um, it's written uh, by some people at CSIRO, so CSIRO in, in Australia. Um, and so it's, the Synchrotron provide it for users, uh, so they have a, a number of licenses that users can access to analyse their data and process their data. And so it runs uh, on their it computer structure? Yeah. It runs on, on their uh, cluster um, there and I'm just logging into the desktop. Uh, and it's all based on IDL uh, for some reason. That we so imagine that keeps things relatively quick, it processes things quickly if it's running on a cluster. But are there uh, any to, um, does it a lot faster? Yeah, it does it a lot faster than when you run it on a local machine. Are there any downsides to um, running it through a remote desktop like this, in your experience? Um, if you don't have a good connection to the remote desktop, it can be annoying. Um, otherwise, it, it's fine. The only tricky part is if you want to upload some specific files back to the system. Mm -hmm. Downloading them is easy, uploading them is not so easy, but this is mostly due to permissions and right protection on folders that they have. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, so we start with the spectrum display and let's assume we've co collected some data. The first thing we need to do is import uh, some spectra. When we click on that, we have a lot of different options and we're collecting synchrotron uh, X-ray fluorescence, but we could also use this for pixie data, for instance. And there's a huge list of detectors that have been uh, coded up for it, and we're doing the, uh, a Maya uh, with corrected files. So this is just uh, we linearize the files before as we save them. Uh, I can then select the files from a list, and this is just going in. And there's one that we want to have a look at, which is here. And here we have the data files from the folder. Each folder is a scan and the files here are broken up into what's called a binary log file and each one is a certain 
uh, size. And here you can see this scan here, we collected 105 uh, scans and I can just sort them like this. Uh, I'm not gonna import them all. I'm just gonna import a subsection of them uh, just because it will take forever. Uh, that then prompts me where I wanna put them afterwards. Put a little folder called demo there. Now it's read the, the header files and it, it has uh, some parameters that it said. So we've got some uh, preamp um, parameters and dwells and things like this. Sometimes it doesn't manage to read them all. You can see if you missed the dwell parameter there. I can put that in and I'm going to just say it will probably about two milliseconds, but we can see. Um, I can also get this data from a preloaded spectrum file or from a DA or from a, a, an image file, which is we call a DAI, a dynamic array image. Um, yeah, and then I can hit OK. And then it asks me for a pileup file. And I've got a, to explain what a pileup is, is, is here we have a window which is um, the amplitude of a, of a detected photon <laughs> event versus the time that that photon event took to go through the system. And I can show this is all the detector elements and I can just scroll through and show individual detector elements with this uh, slider here, which is not working very well. Uh, probably a downside of logging in. Oh, no, it's because I've got this window here open, it's not gonna do it. Uh, but I'm gonna select this one, which is a predefined one we have. And a throttle file is the next one that it asks for. And because we have a lot of backscatter in this detector, we actually throttle the uh, Compton uh, and Elastic scatter because uh, we generally collect orders of magnitude more of that than for any individual element. And we just do this to save time. So we just collect between a certain energy range, we just collect one in 10 photon events and we discard the rest. And then it's loading this up into the cluster and sorting these files and developing my uh, spectrum from it. And this just takes a minute or two. Mm -hmm. And here we have all of the data that, that came out of the spectrum that I selected. Um, you can see there's some mess over the top of it. I have a little button here that goes select and I can select the individual spectra. Uh, the button that I want to use now is called delete all X, Y and T. So this uh, has extracted from the spectrum, not only the photon events, but it's also extracted the, the position and time files, which I don't really care about. Um, and I can actually see here that this didn't uh, apply the throttle correctly. So I'm just going to quickly get back into that again, because else we run into some problems. Mm -hmm. So those are, while you're doing that in the uh, spectrum display there, the, the data that looks like it's behind the fluorescence data, the little steps. Yes, yes tree that you're going to get rid of yeah that's um the data that we have uh, behind those steps is the is the position data and the time data also of interest this data here i can see this this is the compton scatter going up and then it dips down by mm -hmm. about an order of magnitude and this is where the throttle hasn't been applied properly mm -hmm. so this is what i was talking about there i did that on purpose so you can see what the throttle was like mm -hmm. So the throttle would be in there. And that should work. And we should now have that Compton looking much smoother across the top. It's done. Sometimes when you're not doing a huge amount, the cluster can take longer because it takes so much time to load it up and back down from the cluster. Right. Um, when you're not doing when you're doing a big file, you get huge benefits. So there we go. Now we have the the Compton. You can see back where it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, I can delete that X, Y, and T data, and we can just see now our fluorescent spectrum. Uh, and now I can actually go to this time amplitude display and just give you a look at the, the throttle. So here's every individual detector element. And we can see we have a curve where we have uh, what we assume are individual photon events. And then where we have lots of fluorescent data. So in the scatter and usually around iron, for instance, we have 
um, events that where the uh, the time is longer than the amplitude should be. So these are where we have multiple photon events that are overlapping at one energy, mm -hmm. uh, and we exclude them by just drawing a region of interest around around this. Interesting. So we just draw a, a scene around here, and we say if it's outside of this box, mm -hmm. it's, it's more than one event. So we can tweak that as much as you want and you can you know run through the individual elements with this and make sure you've got them all cool um so that's how we exclude pile up in geofixie would you um, um be able to mash all of the detector elements together and draw one box or is it uh, yes you can uh it's just generally easy to easier to draw it over one and then see that it fits the others because sometimes it blurs a bit too much when you have all of them there okay um, but this is just very data dependent. Um, the problem with fitting fluorescence data is it's generally pretty user intensive to do it really well. Um, now we have the spectrum here uh, and you can see if I just select one here, I can go down this and just show different, um, different what, what each different element collected. Yep. And so this is all this, but we, uh, display them all and we have all of it here. Um, Can you show us some of the uh, buttons you have down there that allow you to manipulate that window or some of, the, I guess you'll go through it soon, but any of the operations that you would go through to look at different parts of the spectrum or display it differently? Yeah, so at, at this point, I'm just gonna display it how it is. Of course, we won't, when we get up to about 20 kV here, this is just mostly pile ups that is, is sort of snuck in, uh, we can hit the expand button, which will just expand the spectrum. So we can just see what we want to see. For instance, like this, uh, we also have a, a log lin button, so we can convert it into a linear scale uh, and see that most of what we want is not a lot of counts. But typically we build on a log scale uh, and we go from there. Um, calibrating the data can be uh, tricky. Uh, we have a few different ways of, of um, doing that and it's in of course calibrate here um, i can just click on one here and just select for instance what i assume is uh, iron k alpha and let's just go for the elastic which is at 18.5 kv and what i can then do is just draw two lines and say that is where my iron k alpha should be and that is where my elastic should be Mm -hmm. And then I can just hit all and that will just sort of move it uh, with a lot of spectra in there. It generally doesn't do a very good job. Mm -hmm. uh, how we normally do the, the calibration is on a, on a, on a foil beforehand. Um, and it's actually not too badly done coming off the detector at the moment. Uh, I can get all the energy cows from uh, a spectrum that I've done previously. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if I can just find where we did the standards, I've got one here that I've got calibrated. And then this is just applying a calibration to every spectra. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show you another way to do it later when we get to it, but that's just one way of doing it just with these two lines. And you can scroll through and calibrate every individual detector element. Uh, if you have one or two detector elements, that's easy. When you have 380, it takes forever. You tend not to do it. Um, then what we do is we, we add the spectrum. So we don't want to fit all of these individually. So we just add them into one. So we uh, add it into one. So that and we've instantaneously summed all of the spectra. Yes. Yeah. And because all, the spec all of the detector elements are at a different uh, position, it applies a, a, a sort of a fudge factor based on um, the angle and the, the counts that each detector is, is sort of taking in. Mm -hmm. It does that mostly to the to the Compton scatter because it's going to be a different amount. Um, so we've got one fitted spectra now, one sorry, one summed spectra, and then what we want to do is we want to fit that spectra, obviously. Um, at the moment, I can click on elements, but nothing is appearing, so I'll get rid of those and I'll start where we have to actually start, which is. So I noticed that you've got the different lines, the K, L, M, yep. K, and L, L, and M, they're all color coded. And as you click on those buttons, it cycles through the different yep. lines. Yeah. So if I assume I've got an M, an M line of osmium, then I can just 
select just the M, for instance. If I'm not sure I've got K or I'm not sure if I might have a K, I can select it back onto with a, a right click, I can select it onto these green ones, which are question mark K. So this is thinking about maybe fitting a, a K line, whereas if I go to the green one, it's definitely trying to fit a K line to it. It won't fit it until you press a button, I imagine. It won't fit it until I press uh, several buttons. And so if you saw a peak in that sun spectrum and you're wondering, hey, is that a chromium peak? How yes. would you testing that? How would I do that? I've got a little button here which says a question mark. And here I can go to two options. I can identify the element or I can mark the element. Mm -hmm. um, before I do that, there's another box down here which has got a drop down for different ones. So when I was on the energy calibrate window, it, it, this was on calibrate, which gives me two lines. I can also select then to identify line. And now I can drag a line across here and it will cycle mm. through the elements that it thinks fit around about here. That looks like a very useful little uh, table there. So that's quite useful because it's got all of them. It can get very confusing. I mean, this is, for instance, now I'm on the iron K beta one peak and then I should be able to go up and find iron K beta mm -hmm. K alpha oh. one, for instance, there it is. But you see, there's a lot of other things really close. Yeah. I wonder if it would be useful to have a condensed table with your most common elements. Didn't have all of these more obscure I, ones. I think that would be good. Uh, the one that I, t I tend not to use this one because it, there's just so many things so close. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to use mark element. And of course, the program's buggy. So we go back to just mark element and it gives me a periodic table. And here down the bottom, I've got, I can select K, L or M, and I might as well just select all of them. And for instance, now I can click on an element and it shows me where the, the lines for iron will be. <laughs> uh, I can click on, for instance, platinum and it shows here. Uh, yeah. It's got orange lines, which are the emission lines and dotted blue lines, which are the excited lines. So we've got, we have to be above this energy to excite it and then we get below this. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if I go to one that's going to be close, uh, for instance, molybdenum, I've got these lines here, which should appear here, but I'm not exciting these. Mm -hmm. It's too high an energy to excite. Uh, again, here as well. Uh, and then we get here and we're now exciting these photons. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's helpful. And I usually have that one open when, if I'm fitting a, uh, a sample for the first time. So now the fitting, there's a few things we have to do before we can fit something. Um, and one of those ones is to determine the yields. And the yields is going to give us the expected photon, fluorescent photon yields given a specific set of input parameters and sample parameters. So incident beam and sample parameters. Uh, I'm going to just run through the process of getting a new one. Another window launches up. Lots of windows always launch up. Um, and I'm just going to select a previously made setup and run it through. Because it's, it will take too long. Um, what do we have here? Do you what this one is? I believe this is a, so it's a plastic rock, probably quartz grains and some uh, transition metals and other metals. Okay. So let's call it uh, quartz on glass mm -hmm. for So what we're doing is we're setting up um, what the matrix is, for instance. And you can see uh, we have some detector parameters up here. So we've got, we're saying it's 18 and a half KV. Uh, they're monochromatic photons. Um, we're collecting it on a certain detector that it's positioned uh, in this position. And I can show a little graphic will come up which can show me what it actually looks like. We have the beam going through to the target and we're in the backscatter geometry. So that can be helpful for all sorts of things. Um, it's an array detector. And then here we've got, so I suppose the top half is our incident parameters and, and the, the bottom half is our sample. Uh, we have a target layer. We've said that we, we're two layers. We've got, uh, we're defining layer one and layer one is our unknown. We're saying that layer one is 30 microns thick with a density of 2.648, I assume, standard scientific units. 
and we've called it silicon dioxide. So we're saying this is 30 microns of quartz as a bulk sample matrix, of course, with um, other things in it. Mm -hmm. um, we can then go down to define layer two and layer two, we can see we're now on a one millimeter quartz glass. But we're saying that this is a known layer. So we're not trying to say that there's anything else in it. So this is our substrate, for instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, once we've figured out what our matrix correction should be, yep. are there any other tricks that you might employ to help you figure out what elements you have in your sample or what some of those other like, peaks might be? Ah, yes. Yeah. So, so this sample matrix is, we are, we are not fitting this sample matrix. This is what we consider to be the bulk of the sample. Uh, and it's, a sh it's going to subtract this from everything that we have. And it will use this to, for two reasons. It will use it to fit a background to our data. And it will also use it to calculate uh, and correct for self-absorption based on the angle of each detector element, mm -hmm. yeah, which is going to be different depending on the thickness. And it will boost lower, lighter elements more than uh, heavier elements. Mm -hmm. So this is something you would do before you even started to identify those peaks yes you you actually have to do this before you start to identify the peaks the program won't allow you to fit peaks onto nothing so this is defining our background and you'll see once i hit calculate yields it'll quickly calculate uh, based on the samples that we've put in the detector and the parameters and i'm just going to say yes we'll save that because that's where it was and now we have a purple background line on our sample. I can close that. Um, the, the purple is starting at 3 kV because that's what it's got here. We can see that this is not right and we have stuff below it. So I'm going to change this uh, lower energy range to uh, about 1.8, which should maybe even be a bit less than that. And you can see my purple line just continues on. And I'll just do it until we hit that. Uh, line where we get a sharp drop off in the detection. Um, a couple of buttons here that are default checked on and I like to uncheck them. Cal on will try and calibrate the spectrum with uh, respect to energy to fit the elements you've selected. Uh, tail on will try and automatically fit a Compton tail, which I find does not a very good job. And full width half max will try and automatically fit a full width half max of the uh, peaks. I'm not going to do any of that. Another interesting thing we have here is Q. And Q, if I click that box, uh, converts from an incident flux to an expected fluorescent yield. So this is our calibration mm -hmm. number, I suppose, that we're using to convert from incident flux to output numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we yeah. do this with, with a, uh, a, a known sample first and we fit that and we, we adjust this number till we get the known concentrations that we have in that sample. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have little wizards that do this for us. Mm -hmm. So now I've got my background, I can start to put elements on top and we've already identified that we have iron and as soon as I click iron, it now puts a fit on top of that. And it's just fitted mm -hmm. those iron peaks that we identify when we click on iron. Yeah. Also has got another little peak here, which is a, a should be at about three kV less, which is a, a silicon escape peak. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it automatically is calculating all those escape peaks as well. Yeah. So in uh, order to see where an escape peak would be, all you have to do is select the element you think it might be related to, and it'll show up there. Um, I can actually just go display uh, silicon escapes. Ooh, that's very. Cool. We've mm. got our silicon escape spectrum, I suppose. So this is just, it's just a mirror of the spectrum shifted mm. uh, down in counts and down in energy. Are there any other little tricks like that that uh, you might want to show us? Um, there are, but we'll get to them. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I'm just, what I'm doing now is just selecting elements. Uh, generally, we have uh, the elements contained in stainless steel because there's a lot of stainless steel around the chamber. Um, and then I'm just going to go up in here, say we've probably got some calcium, not a lot, potassium. We have argon because of the systems in air. Uh, maybe not much of these lower elements here. 
a tiny little bump of silicon there and maybe a tiny bump of aluminium. Um, arsenic, maybe no selenium, bromine, <laughs> krypton. I'm just gonna go through and fit some. Yep. And zirconium. Mm -hmm. And now I've got a whole lot fitted in. I'm missing something here, which will be titanium. And now I'm going to fit one, and it's just going to do its best job at fitting that. It's done not a too bad job. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see we've fitted something here where there isn't. We've missed something here, and we've missed something here. So we probably might go, that sounds like it could be vanadium, which is a nice one mm -hmm. to generally have as well. Um, this one here, I think, was cobalt didn't exist there. And that's gotten rid of that. And we probably have gallium in there. So now we've got a, a fit that looks kind of okay. We're now going to do a whole lot of fitting up here and I'm just going to really quickly do that because that can be a bit of a problem. Yep. Um, if I click on the advanced tab, I've got something called widths. I know that the widths are not 300 um, K, 300 EV. <laughs> and this is fitting it for where the uh, manganese K alpha edges as well. They're closer to 270 and this is based on basic detector parameters and things like that. Looks like we have a lot of extra functionality in here to get that fit as good as it can be. There's a lot uh, and I've got this one here which I'm just going to quickly put some budget out a bit which is also might be somewhat important but this is just uh, parameters which are changing the, the um, position of the Compton scatter and how it affects uh, the fit. And you can spend a lifetime fitting this perfectly yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not always mm -hmm. beneficial. Okay. Um, but that looks, we'll say that looks great and we're done. Uh, this little bit here I'm not super fast with. This is generally pile-ups that we haven't fitted perfectly or haven't excluded perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, we're missing a peak down there, which will be sulfur. And there we've got a, a, a reasonable fit and I can go on forever doing this, but in the interest mm -hmm. of time, we'll leave it there. Yep. What I then have to do is create what we call a DA matrix, which we're then going to use to sort our incident data. And there's a button here called generate DA matrix. So I'm going to click on that. Uh, I've got two options here. I've got a normal one or I've got a Zane's one. The Zane's one is not really uh, important here. So we'll just go to the normal one. And then I click OK. It asks me where I want to save it. I'll save it uh, with the file, which was 37050. And I'll save that. And now I can, I've got a button here, which, I, which is called P, which will show me all the peaks. And this is what we've fitted to our data. So essentially by creating that DA matrix file, you have generated a new corrected data set from which you will pull out the maps. Is that right? Um, I've, so how we're actually generating an image is we are sorting uh, uh, energy versus time files through a, a matrix inversion process. So this is my uh, inverting matrix, so to speak, that I've created. Okay. Yep. So I've essentially created a lookup table that says if the photon is here, then it belongs to this element. Yep. Uh, you can see there's huge overlap with everything throughout here. So it's actually taking uh, ratios of, of no, known ratios of K alpha to K beta, uh, K to M, these sort of things. Right. So it's saying we have a known number of um, and a known ratio. So if I have two K alpha ion photons, I need one K beta, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so it's making sure that all those numbers fit and are um, consistent throughout the fit. Okay. Um, yeah. So now we go up into this sort EVT window. And what we're going to do is we're going to put that file into the dynamic array analysis projection. Mm -hmm. And I've saved it. Um, not in there. This has a horrible uh, setup for just creating windows and folders for you. Um, 
So we've got our dynamic array here. I'm going to save it in the output of demo again because I don't want to mess it up. Um, I've got my calibration numbers here. I'm mm -hmm. going to get them from the file that we um, used to calibrate our data in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of things you can put in what sort of data it is, what the detector is. Um, we can go flux here and it's pulled up our preamp sensitivity uh, and our dwell and we've got our conversion that was we created from our standards. Mm -hmm. um, the scan, I can compress it however much I want. So if I've collected uh, non-uniform scan data, so if I've, if I've sampled every 10 microns in Y and two microns in X, I can correct mm -hmm. from that here. Um, there's some device parameters, which is just for clearing a little border if you want to clear a border. So sometimes um, you, you over scan and you want to clear a border, for instance, you can do that here. Um, we generally do that before we uh, write the data anyway. Um, then I'm going to go to my first file and I'm going to go back and find the first file that I did, which was here, here, here. Mm -hmm. And when I click that, it's gonna say, do I wanna use these parameter automatically generated ones? Yes and yes. And it's saying, it's pretty much saying, do you wanna use the pile up and throttle that you used when you were collecting the data? And we make sure that we set that correctly so that yes, we do wanna do that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's saving in the right place. Comments that we use to collect the data are now here and the data, the sample number. Um, and we have also, of course, the device. It's a Maya synchrotron and we use the high mod to detect them. This is just a few little, little things. Yep. Um, we're clustering and we've got another button here, which is flatten. And flatten we check on, which actually uh, normalizes the data to the incident beam flux at, for that pixel. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes up for any variation in the flux. Yep. And we hit start and this might take a minute to do because there's a lot of files in here. Okay, while that's running, yes. um, are there any other tricks in that spectrum display you think it's worth talking about even if you can't press the buttons? Um, What's the S button down there in the, in the bottom bar? I can't remember. I haven't used it for a long time. Okay, never mind about that one then. Um, there are the errors and the and the difference. Uh, if you click on errors, it will show you the, the calculated error for each, um, so for each, how does each it, point. How does it calculate the error? I think it does a numerical one, but I haven't really looked into it. But if you look, if you actually look at it, if we click it, the error appears to just be proportional to counts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and is the, and the sort of. Uh, one spectrum or detector element subtracted from another or something? The, the difference you mean? Yeah, what's the difference? The difference is, is the displayed spectra compared to your fitted spectra. Right. So sometimes it's very hard to see if you've done a good fit and you can yep. just show the difference between them and it'll highlight any differences quite clearly. Yeah. Um, and at, at some point with every fit like this, it's, you get very diminishing returns very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But once we've got this image, which is coming along quite quickly. Uh, it's just got to get it all back off the cluster and then I can, we can go through some more exciting parts, I think. Yep. Do you use the difference or residual um, display there very often? Uh, I generally don't because I, I'll show you what I generally do and find much more in, important and um, informative, I suppose, which is this. Um, we now have our image uh, mm -hmm. because it's a weird program that will do all sorts of weird stuff when I rescale it. Um, and what uh, the first element that's shown is background, which essentially is that those residuals or those unfitted parts. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, you want this to be uniform. Uh, it's not in this case. Um, yeah. And so residual would um, vary across the energy range. When you display the background map, is it the, just the sum of all of the residual counts? Yeah, so this is, this, uh, there is energy information behind this, but this is, we've now converted from energy space into pixel space. 
<laughs> so we've, I suppose energy is now encoded in this uh, drop down box for elements. And the background, instead of representing the difference or residual at a certain peak position, it's just the whole spectrum summed together. Right? Uh, it's it's in an X Y. It's the background in, in in X Y space rather than in energy space. Yeah, it's it's just taken the whole sum of the energy space background. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. um, in a perfect world, this would be perfectly flat, and we, we wouldn't have structure in it. But we have structure, and it tells us that we've most likely missed something, and we've most likely mixed something in these spots where we see this distribution. But only in certain areas. And so one of the things you might want to do, I guess, would be to um, sub-select one of those regions and yeah. Yeah. fit to that region. Um, yep, so I'll get to that in a second. What we've got though, if I can just quickly scroll through, we've sure. got our fits to all of our data and it's just here displaying it as a percentage of the maximum value that we get. So for instance, I'll move my mouse there, we've got argon, potassium, um, mm -hmm. calcium, titanium, for instance, and we can see all of these maps. Um, and of course, when you have a very bright spot, it's, it swamps the signal, and so you can just move yeah. it down until you can see what it looks like. Um, change the thresholds. Can you change yeah. the the scaling? Um, for example, make it a log uh, color scale. Uh, yes. So it's currently linear. I can make it a log color scale, or I can make it a square root color scale. Ooh. The square root color scale is quite often very useful. Mm -hmm. Um, what I generally do with the data once I've got it fitted, I suppose, is I generally export it as a 32-bit um, uh, TIF mm -hmm. and I'm converting it, I, I, so I don't know if you saw it, but I export it in, in units which is called aerial density, mm -hmm. which is in uh, nanograms per square centimetre. So because I don't necessarily have a 100% handle on the thickness and the density in, in Z, mm -hmm. not element, but, but sample Z, I, I yeah. can't actually convert reliably to parts per million unless I know that perfectly. Um, so anyway, we get back to a couple of other the visualizations, something that we might want to do is first of all, just do a, an idiot check and make sure that things look right. Like, you know, mm -hmm. Do we have some of these elements in here, for instance? Mm -hmm. um, or is it just rubbish? Yeah. Um, there are a couple of windows which are useful. One of them is, is just a three element RGB image. And we can just show, for instance, um, calcium versus whatever we want, really. Strontium, rubidium, doesn't really matter, but we can just show three overlays of things. Yep. Yeah and see where they are in space and we can change the uh, displayed concentrations here. Um, this is linked. So if I go here and I, I can change it here as well, then we'll change it over there. Yeah. Um, another thing that then I can do is something that's quite interesting and useful and gets back to what you were saying is element associations. And this is just plotting, uh, concentration versus concentration. So if I go to background, I can say this is my where I have a low count in the background and this is where I have a high counts. Uh, I can change the color scaling on that just to highlight the low counts a bit better. I can just select these so that yeah, I can select these uh, high values here and I can <laughs> go analyze that. And it shows me, I don't know if you can see, but in, in some of these bright spots are now green. Mm -hmm. If I select a bit more from that, you can see they come out a bit more green. Yep. And we say this looks like now we have selected those spots mm -hmm. that, were, that were in our data. Now we have a roundabout way of getting this. I've got something called image regions here and I'll just clear that entirely. Mm -hmm. And whenever I click on analyze here, it yep. pops up with a new region. Mm -hmm. And it says the image that I've selected here is back back, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go back to what I was doing there and I'll grab that. Uh, it also tries to show us the percentages of different elements we've got in. This. Cool. You can see the quantification is not super good because we've got 620% cool. iron. So this yep. is 
most likely related to the Q value we put back mm. down here. But very quickly, you were able to identify spatially where those dodgy spectra were and potentially yes. include them. Yeah. Uh, what I can do now is I can select either an individual detector element and get the spectra, I can get the whole array. Mm -hmm. And now I can put this EVT button, which gives me, first of all, a region file, which saves where all these green spots are. Mm -hmm. and so I'll save that. And then it's asking me for a spec file, which is the, the spectrum that we fitted down here. And so I'm now going to save that. And what it now does is sometimes takes quite a while, but now it's extracting the spectrum just from those regions. Mm -hmm. So this takes a little while. This goes all the way back to the raw data files that we put in up here that we collected and goes back and finds wherever we have this X and Y position and it pulls out the spectra. Mm -hmm. And now I can analyze that separately. Right. Once this is Very good. Yeah. yeah. So this is how we identify a, something that might be in a uniformly negligible concentration, but yet has small dots of high concentration. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. might have in the bulk, you know, one part per trillion, but it, it might all be concentrated uh, at quite high concentrations in very small areas. Yeah, which I guess is one of the unique problems with micro XRF, but also an advantage in that you can find these things. But yeah. in order to generate these quantitative maps, you need to uh, locate them. Yeah, you need to find them. And of course, this is what... Um, you know, a small plug, this is what the Australian Synchrotron does well, is we can get such large maps that you can then go and dig in later down the track. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, if you were just looking at a small area, you might very well miss these small dots. Yeah. Um, so you, that's, that's loading. I'm just wondering, you've got a few different windows up there, and they were linked in the sense that you could change that thresholding in detail on your yes. main, and that would change your RGB image. Yes. Maybe windows. Can you link other functions for example if you have a cursor up there or a polygon or something um other things are linked for instance if i want to i don't know if it'll allow me to do it but here i've got something where it says distance but i can also select a, an area on this one and it's not going to let me do it because that's happening and that will show up on this rgb one as well okay cool um, so there, um selection tools are they in that yeah so here's some, yeah so i can just use it as a, a spline for instance or or a box or a circle for instance. Which of those do you find most useful? Um, we generally use, uh, I use generally use box most often which we actually use to select a box and then we can, uh, hang on I'm just going to skip remaining off that because it will be here forever otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, with the box I can draw a box on this one, whatever it's doing. Maybe I can't. Okay, we've got it back. No, maybe I have to clear that first. So I notice there are a few bugs with this software. Uh, there's, there's a lot maybe. of bugs. It's, I suppose it's written by one person who does it. But anyway, uh, here it's got the um, positions of, of the data in it. Um, hang on, I had a box there. Why wouldn't let me draw another one? There's actually a box here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, so this actually encodes, if we can see now, we've got the box size mm -hmm. in this window down here, but I have to go back into the box. Um, so it shows me the box size in, in <coughs> actual units. Uh, and yeah. it's also got the origin, which is the origin of the stages. So this is encoding the positions of the sample. Mm -hmm. So we actually use this like we did here where we took a, a very large overview and then if I want to take a smaller view of this at higher resolution or higher dwell, then I can take the numbers of this box and program it straight into the, the um, scanning stages and redo that area. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed you can fairly rapidly flick between different maps of different elements. Yes. But if you wanted to pull up, say, a calcium map and maybe a titanium map, for example, side by side, and then would um, use your cursor to select or just indicate a certain region. Could you do that and link between the two views? Um, the way to do that is with um, this guy here and you see the box is, yeah. mm -hmm. so if I wanted to show titanium, 
and something else. So uh, you would just then, fiddle with the thresholds until it was clear that you were um, on the same grain or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, if I, if I wanted to find something that was rich in calcium and titanium, for instance, I could go make sure I'm showing all my calcium really brightly, uh, go to titanium and really highlight that. And then I can uh, just select the box and I've got to move this one. And you can see the other box changes mm -hmm. with that. Um, all right, what else is in the, the uh, display drop down up there? That might be interesting. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff that is, is designed more for post-processing stuff, which I don't typically use because mm -hmm. uh, I generally do it uh, in um, an outside program. Mm -hmm. um, there are things like uh, PCA that you can do. Uh, I don't generally use it. I find it counterintuitive to do it in GeoPixie. Um, mm -hmm. Some people like to do everything in GeoPixie. I like to get quantitative images out of GeoPixie. Right. Um, if we go to this spectrum display, this is what we pulled out of that data before. Yeah. The background points. And I've got yep. my spectrum fit again. And I can now just fit one to that. And it shows here we don't have a lot of counts. I probably should have let it go for longer. Um, yeah. Looks like a reasonably good fit, though. What do you think was the problem? Those. It looks reasonably good. I'm not sure what the problem was, but there's. I think if we went it, let it go for longer, we would probably see um, mm -hmm. something where we've missed an element along the way somewhere. Yep. But it does look relatively good. Maybe there's something here that we've missed. Um, you can see if we look in... Mm -hmm. uh, here, here there's a bump in, in this that we haven't fitted so our fit is the red which dips down where we go up here yep so it could be you use those little buttons down there I've noticed to manipulate the spectrum window can you sort of use your mouse wheel or anything like that in the um, no you've got the, the sliders here and you've got shrink and expand and widen and full yep and they I just use shrink and expand full just shows you the full spectrum mm -hmm. uh, and um, shrink makes it smaller, but it can't because it's showing all of it. Expand makes it wider. Um, for some reason, they're really buggy. Yeah. So if you could, um, <laughs> question for you, if you could add any functionality or fix any bugs with this software, what would, they, what would that be? Um, um, I would, apart from just removing the stuff that I never use. Um, so what the main bugs that it has, I suppose, are that it, it seems to want to make up new folders and not remember where you are. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lot of accounting that misses the mark somewhere along the way. Right. Um, would you say having so many options for so many different applications and so many different power users makes it difficult for you to navigate through it? I think it makes it very difficult for new users to navigate through, yes. Mm. Almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. I can see where the, where the problem with this spectrum is. We've, we've actually, there's a couple of these peaks here which in, look like there's something else mm -hmm. in there, and it would probably be something um, like. Not quite. We're sort yeah, of running that time. guy. I wonder, is there anything that, that we've missed? Um, I don't think so. Um, but that, so it was uh, half mium that was we were missing. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's you can see now it's fitted a lot better through here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's so sort of to say that the the, um, the peak fitting is is at the heart of what happens. Everything sort of revolves around um, fitting those peaks and figuring out what elements you have and where. Yeah, and then, and then using the tools where you're extracting spectrum from from sub areas to refit to find mm -hmm. other stuff. Yeah, is I think that's where the the power lies, and that it does it all very quickly and very accurately. Yeah, um, much. And you can imagine if you have a spectrum like this, you would never find. Half me, I'm doing a region of interest fit on this. Yep. 
Cool. Okay. We might leave it there then because yep. we don't generate a file that's too long. Thank yep. you very much for running through that.